Okay. Well, well, we're fixing to start. You can sit there if you'd be good. Everybody's trickling in. Good evening, everyone. Good to see everyone. I'm sure we got several away on fall break and a few back in Bible Bowl, studying for Bible Bowl. Um, that's this this weekend. Oh, there come the Bible Bowl kids. Come on in, guys and girls. Hand me the clicker there, Brooks. i uh, just give you a couple updates. Prayer request, Miss Jean Bryant uh, is under hospice care in Louisville. This is um, um, Linda Jocelyn's mother. Amanda Sinks uh, continues down in Atlanta. That's um, uh, Jennifer Batson's sister. And Miss Pat Metcalf continues recovering home. Miss Joanne Summers is still at the Medical Center in Bowling Green. Uh, she's uh, battling pneumonia, but she's getting better every day and uh, improving. Uh, Kenny Perkins is at home under some hospice care. Um, and then also continue to remember uh, Blaine Martin, grandson of Jana Hammock. And we also did take the Everyone Counts up for Blaine and the family uh, this past Sunday. If you missed a chance, opportunity to give during that day, uh, just um, you can hand that over to myself or one of the elders or one of the ministers, and we'll take care of that. Uh, Bible Bowl is this weekend. As I mentioned, the kids, how many of there are there? 12, 13 of y'all? We'll just say 12 or 13. Eight. Eight? I know, I meant going this weekend. There you go, 12 or 13. All right. They're going to Cookville this weekend. We leave Friday and we stay overnight, and then the competition is there at uh, Tennessee Tech University on Saturday. So uh, pray for us as we uh, travel over, give a safe travel there and back, and uh, that the kids will do um, well on their, their uh, Bible Bowl competition. Uh, every uh, quarter we change over group leaders, so uh, these are your group leaders in your groups. And uh, if you're one of those group leaders and didn't know it, well, there you go. So you're the group leader for the next quarter. That's October, November, December. So if y'all know of a need or anything in a specific group, uh, just let one of them know or let us know in the office and we'll get a hold of them and help out in that way uh, possible. Next Wednesday is uh, People Serving People. Um, that's uh, one of our other opportunities to give back to the community and uh, feed them. Uh, I'll be uh, taking charge of that if you need, uh, if you'd like to help out with that, just please see me and I'll put you to work. We start, I start prepping about nine o'clock and then uh, we get ready, get closer time at 1030 and then we serve the meal from 11 to 1230 and then cleanups about 30 minutes. So that's why it's 1030 to one, okay? And then the ladies are going to transform uh, ladies conference. This is a new conference in Pigeon Forge and Sandra Hurts in, in charge of that. Um, they do have a couple spots available if anybody's interested in maybe adding really late. Uh, just see Sandra, or if you didn't get a chance to attend the meeting Sunday, uh, please see Sandra as well, and she'll uh, get you uh, informed about that. And then there's some several things about for October. I'm going to send out one more email about the church fall retreat. We need several replies about that. If not, we're going to have to cancel that uh, just due to lack of interest, and we'll reschedule for next year. And I, I know a lot of people's busy, but um, if we don't have a certain number, uh, it's just not cost-effective to go. But we really want to go, so we'll send out that email. Please reply to that email. Ambassadors meets tomorrow. Trunk or Treat's coming up. And then on the 30th, uh, also after Trunk or Treat, we'll do Trunk or Treat from 2.30 to 4.30. And then after that, we'll have our all-life group fellowship where everybody doesn't have to run home for their life groups that night. We'll just stay here and we'll do an all-life group finger, uh, finger food fellowship meal and devotional that night after that. All right, Steve has one more announcement and then he'll lead us in singing. Uh, Travis, you can switch it when Steve gets ready here in a minute. One, one quick announcement I'll make. About, about three weeks ago, um, I received a call from Travis Creek and he shared with us that his wife passed away in South Carolina. That following Sunday morning, he called and asked that we have prayer for him and that situation. We did here at the building. Um, we found out this week that Miss Creek did not take her life, 
that she is alive. And I've talked with her. It was a shock. And that's basically all I know. I don't have enough other truths to make any assessments or anything about this. Uh, we were dealing with this with the facts that we had. So I wanted you to know because several of you have sent communications to the family and been praying for them and, and, and they certainly do need our continued prayers, that's for sure. But I did want to share that with you. Now let's begin with singing. <clears throat> The Lord reigns, he is a mighty God. The Lord God reigns, the Lord reigns, he is a mighty God. The Lord God reigns, great is the Lord Almighty, he is Lord, he is God indeed. Great is the Lord Almighty, he is God supreme. Great is the Lord Almighty, he is Lord, he is God indeed. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. The Lord reigns, he is the mighty God, the Lord God reigns. The Lord reigns, he is a mighty God. The Lord God reigns. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord my God. Hosanna in the highest. Glory, glory. Glory to the King of kings, glory, glory, glory to the King of kings. Lord, we lift up your name with hearts full of praise. Be exalted, O Lord my God, Hosanna in the highest. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles, if you have those with you, um, I'll be reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, most in, the ch in chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Our focus will be in verses 9 through uh, 14. On Sunday, Kirby spoke very highly of our farmers here in Simpson County, acknowledging the foresight, uh, the hard work, and the patience that it takes to ensure a successful harvest season. Uh, tonight, I want to begin uh, by uh, expressing gratitude to those of you, even amongst our number here tonight, who embrace this, this way of life, uh, the service that you give to our local community. Uh, farmers have a privileged relationship with God's creation, and many enjoy a lifestyle that has been passed down through, fam through a family lineage for centuries. The lifestyle comes with a multitude of highs as well as an abundance of lows. But it is no secret that farming can be a very lonely way of life at times. Currently, our farmers are faced with the reality that small family-run farms are declining in America. Farmers are an aging demographic, most between the ages of 52 and 57, and statistics show that less than one-third of private family farms have a designated family successor. 
small farmers are subjected to extreme weather conditions, unstable markets, and pressures from much larger corporations. Farming remains the only profession in which man deals constantly with the laws of universe and the laws of life. In Ecclesiastes 1 verse 3, we read the question, What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? This is a rhetorical question because the answer is found just one verse before. The preacher proclaims, all is vanity. Small family farmers carry an incredible weight and tremendous responsibility with them to work each and every day. At times, I'm sure their labor appears in vain. Their bills pile up, life happens, nature takes its toll. So where can our farmers look for help? If we are not careful, our Christian lives too become a very lonely pursuit. We are baptized into Christ, the very highest of highs, and left to wander the world, attempting to make sense, like the farmer, of the laws of the universe and of life. While often well-intentioned, our actions, desires, and pursuits fall short of the glory of God. Our failures, our insecurities, our shame cause us to turn inward, and we are, we are encouraged by the influences within the world to pursue personal liberty and personal truth. Our faith easily becomes a very personal battle, and all our efforts presumably in vain. Our bills pile up, our life happens, nature takes its toll, so where does the Christian have to look for help? When I think about the farmers and the ones that I've met in my lifetime, I visit a very fond memory that I have from when I was just a kid. On occasion when we were working uh, with my dad, he would take us to the small storefront located in Woodburn at the crossroads of 31W and 240. Once inside, we would get like a Coke or whatever snack we wanted, uh, a corn dog, and we would be accompanied by the farmers of that area. Most of these men were men of the church that I looked up to, men from the community that I could look at as mentors or as examples of what it looked like to be a Christian. Looking back, I, I now understand that storefront to be a retreat for the farmers of the area, a safe place where they could rest, commune, and fellowship with others who had like and shared experiences, where a young farmer could look to a mentor and ask important questions where jokes were shared and stories were told and relationships formed. Inside that storefront, farmers could confide in a friend, find relief, and find relief from the incredible pressures that persisted in their line of work. When pressure piles up for the small family farmer, he looks to a friend, someone that he can call on, confide in, and trust. And when hard times come their way, a small farm looks to the community for support. Likewise, being a Christian should be a social endeavor. As Christians, we should be in constant pursuit of community because life is hard, but it is often made easier with the help of a friend. In Ecclesiastes 3 verse 9, again the quest question is asked, what profit has the worker from that in which he labors? This time the answer is different. In verse 10, we read, I have seen the God-given task which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. I know that nothing is better than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. It was in that small storefront that those local farmers sought out a community in which each man could eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. The small farmer's work is a gift from God and a beautiful gift. Now, I would like to encourage our farmers today to continue to look for opportunities to rejoice and celebrate the good that comes from the long hours that you work. The church must be a safe place for the lost in our community. As baptized believers, each of us has been given a beautiful gift that is the grace of God. And it is now time for each of us to go to work 
understanding that our labor is not in vain. Our God-given task is to love. Jesus calls us up and out of ourselves and into a community where our labor is to do good. The church is here to help and to support and to be a friend. Through Jesus, God has made everything beautiful in its time. As he calls us out of our sin, our insecurities, and our shame, and into a community where there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, where there is only one truth that is able to set us free. Oftentimes, the farmer makes sacrifices to ensure that his work continues. They pour absolutely everything they have into their work, hopeful for a harvest. Jesus embodied sacrifice in the outpouring of love from the cross. Jesus was living hope. The church must exist today as living hope, a community of imperfect people willing to live a living sacrifice. In communion and in fellowship with one another, seeking to love their God and their neighbor. Our church must be a place where anyone could walk in and find a friend, to let their guard down and find the relief from the incredible pressures that persist in the world today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for this day. Father, we're mindful at this time of the many ways that you have blessed us here. Bless us individually and as a congregation gathered here in Franklin. Father, please watch o over us uh, this evening as we go about our separate ways, as we go and set aside time for study, as we open up your word and, and we glean from it what we can. Father, help us to, to take your word and, and to be um, your love to those that we come in contact with. Uh, to those that are in our community, that we can show your love to them. Uh, that as we spend time here this evening, that we grow closer in relationship to one another, Father, but more importantly, that we grow closer in relationship to you. Father, just continue to watch over us, uh, to bless us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You're dismissed. My hot. There you go. All right. How's everybody doing? I don't sound too enthusiastic. Y'all be happy. Tonight's the last night I got to talk to y'all. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right. There we go. That makes me feel better. That's good. That's all right. You hear the, you've heard the Kentucky boy for four weeks. Now you get to hear the Tennessee boy here in the next whatever many weeks. So anyway. All right. Uh, good to have everyone here tonight. Like we said, uh, we've been uh, looking through the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John for the last four weeks. And um, try to rem remind you, it was our goal in class to make sure that we're learning to have better fellowship with not only God, Jesus, but also ourselves. And that's what we've been looking at. So, you know, over these last few weeks, we've looked into these scriptures. We've seen that God is light, God is love. And then we've also learned how to be able to share both those light, the light and love that we've encountered. Uh, we've raised several questions during this time together, and we've had some several good solutions of how we can be the light for God and that we need to be and also show the love to others around us. Last week we learned um, how God gave us a gift through the birth, life, uh, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we understood that the plan of salvation is the ultimate gift for all of us. And all uh, we must be doing, willing to do is accept that gift and take that gift and, and cherish that gift and use that. Uh, we also discussed 1 John 5 and 16. And we concluded, uh, we, we, and concluded it was talking about the sins that leads to death. And we produced a few answers and finally concluded that was probably uh, referring to the unpardonable sin. 
Uh, the one about blaspheming the Holy Spirit, denying that there is a God, Jesus Christ, and understanding all that. But I want a little reference back to that a little bit because uh, I'm not sure I answered the question and the person that raised the question I talked to after class and I answered the question, but I want to make sure I answered the question for y'all to make sure we were all understanding there because it was a little bit confusing there a few verses. You can go back and read verse 16, but then in verse 17 it says, All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. Now, here's my, here's my interpretation. This is what I think it's talking about there. All right? Because that's the question. Sin that does not lead to death. What is a sin that does not lead to death? And like I said, it's referenced also in verse 16. Well, my thought is that is everyone, we've talked about this several times before, everyone sins and falls short of the glory of God. Right? We know that verse. We know everybody sins, everybody can ask for forgiveness and return back to God. So, you know, does that mean when we sin, we're going to die in that sin and ha never have a chance to go to heaven? Well, of course, we know the answer is no, because we know that we are of God, we are of Christ, and we can be forgiven of those sins. All we got to do is ask for God for forgiveness. So what I'm thinking here is in John verse 17, is he's talking about the sins that do not lead to death as any sin that can be forgiven by God. And we're determined that uh, sin leads to death in blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. You're not asking for forgiveness. If you get to that point and you have not asked for forgiveness, you still deny God, you're in that part, and you die, you're, you're going to experience eternal damnation because you have totally rejected Him. But if, you're doing, if you've committed some sins like gossip, uh, slander, theft, any of the, you know, different kinds of sins, then you can repent, you're, you can be repentant of those sins, ask for forgiveness, and still have that chance to reap the benefits of the salvation of God. So committing those types of sins do not lead to a spiritual death, okay? So I think that's what it's referring to in that passage there, the sins that does not lead to death. We commit sins, but they're not going to lead to a spiritual death if we ask for forgiveness like the other one that doesn't in your total denial of who God is. Okay, make that clear? Does everybody understand that? Clear as mud, right? Agree or disagree? Okay, all right. So I think that's where we're at there. It, it's kind of a confusing thing because you kind of look at that and you said, sin that does not lead to death. What, well, what's that? So I, there's where I think that conclusion is. So all right, so we're going to be in 2 John and third John, two very short books, uh, two very short letters. Actually, we we understood that John's writing these letters uh, to these churches, and one of these specific letters, we'll talk about that in a minute, is really to a specific person. So we're going to look at Second John six, and it says this: <clears throat> "And this is love that we walk according to His commandments. This is commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it." So a couple of weeks ago, we defined love and looked at the four distinct uh, types of love. And some people struggle with what love is because their perception of love comes from things of the world. So the world tries to tell us what love is and what love is not. That's the world trying to tell us that. We get the false narratives and intentions about love because the world is trying to make it out something to be something that it's not. Uh, but we need to realize that we need to stop right there and understand the true definition of love comes from God. And we know the true definition comes from God because we see it in the Bible. Uh, he has been teaching it. He's been showing it. He's uh, been loving us all from the beginning of time. And especially Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the Corinthian Christians there, and told them what the true meaning of love is and we've all read it before. We've written it down. We've seen it or we've heard it at weddings. We've heard it at funerals. You might even, lots of people, I, I, had, a, I had a frame one time. I think, um, I don't even know where we have it in our house now. But anyway, we had a frame that I bought Nisha for a, a present sometime. And it had this verse on it that reminds us of love. And we all know the love passage, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 7. Love is patient. Love is kind. And it's not jealous, love does not brag, and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomely, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong, su a wrong suffer, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. 
So the main source of love comes from God himself. And if you really think about it, who else would you want to learn about love from? So let's try something here. What I want you to think about here, and I'm, I've got it right here. I want you to take this verse, and we're going to make it a little bit different. And maybe you've done this before. We're going to replace love with God, and we're going to replace the it's. Some different versions have it's, or different. We're going to replace that with the him. So it's going to read a little bit like, it's going to read like this. God is patient. God is kind. He does not envy. He does not boast. He is not proud. He does not dishonor others. He is not self-seeking. He is not easily angered. He keeps no record of wrongs. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. So by doing this, we are truly defining who God is because love with God shows that God is love. And they're one and the same. So since we have truly defined love, we also know now that God, or who God is, and how we can be more like love and truly love Christ and His church. So back to that second John, this verse is telling us that love means doing what God has commanded us to do. John is just reemphasizing the greatest commandment that Jesus gave us throughout the Gospels. And you can see that in different verses. And in different chapters of the Gospels, Matthew 22, Mark 12, Luke 10, and John 13. The greatest commandment for us is to love one another just as Christ loved us. So some might think this to be a little, some of us might, or some people might think that to be a little bit hard. And we've talked about a little bit that uh, over the last couple weeks, but it's very simple. All we must need, all we need to strive to do is to be like Jesus and truly love others and see others for who they are. I talked about that Sunday. You know, I said that Sunday, somebody you're going up to, somebody you're inviting to church, somebody that you're trying to encourage, they might not look like you, they might not smell like you, they might not uh, have money like you, they might not live in a house like you. It, it doesn't matter. We still need to love them for who they are. They're a soul. But it's difficult. We have that sometimes, and we remember, but if we remember the command, then we can come to an understanding of what needs to be done because we need to do it for Him. You know, sometimes it might be hard to love someone that has done something against you, done something against your family. It's hard. I understand that. But Jesus had difficult situations that He also dealt with. But in the end, He always showed compassion. He always showed caring for the individual of what they needed in that time and that moment. So we are truly, uh, if we are truly having a constant fellowship with Jesus and continually having the Holy Spirit in our lives guiding us, when a situation arises, the Lord will help guide us through that difficult time or whatever's right there in front of us. You know, we have to remember, you know, fellowshipping with Jesus today is a little bit different back in the day when the disciples were, because the disciples were there right by his side. They were working with him. They were eating with him. They were relaxing with him, praying together so much more. They were doing all these things. So how can we have fellowship with Jesus just like the disciples did back then? You know, he isn't physically here on this earth. So how in the world can we show or have that same type of fellowship with Jesus? We've got to have that spiritual connection with Jesus, and it can be a lot stronger than the physical one if we just let it. You know, unfortunately, as human beings, we want that physical connection, but we must understand that Jesus lives inside us, and if we truly let him, he will guide us through everything that we're dealing with all the time. We just have to freely let him in. You know, we can maybe associate our lives maybe to like a radio. Now, I know radios are kind of going out of style. Um, you're, you're streaming everything or you're doing other things, but if you think about that old radio or newer radio in your house, when you're trying to find that station, you just kind of got to fine tune it in. You got to just try to find the station, push the right buttons, find the music that you like, and make sure you're doing all right. Well, that's the same way with Jesus, I think. Sometimes we get our lives out of tune and the wavelengths are not there. We just need to make sure we're trying to focus back on Jesus, turn those knobs a little bit, make sure we're associated, get all the static out of the way, 
and, and understand where Jesus needs to be, and all things will become a little bit clearer. You know, some might say if loving one another is the greatest command, does that mean that we don't have to follow any of the other commands? Well, of course not. You know, we've got to follow other commands. Because if you really think about it, when you follow the commandments, it's, it's the beginning of following all the others too. Love one another is the greatest sign of an individual not being selfish. So when we are truly unselfish and loving, we are following all the other commandments. So here's a couple questions to ponder. What are some of the other commandments that we've been given? What are some of them? Love your neighbor as yourself. What else? Don't have any other, I mean, we're talking about the Ten Commandments. Don't have any other gods before me. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You know, all those different things. If we think about all of those, what are we doing? If we keep Jesus first, then we're not going to do those things. Okay? It's going to keep us from being selfish because all those, if you think about it, all those different commandments, anything else that's talked about in the Bible, it's people being selfish and doing things for themselves. That's what gets them into trouble. That's what gets us into trouble is we're being selfish because we want it our way, right? We want it our way and not God's way. How do these commandments relate to the main commandment of loving one another? Well, I kind of oh, said that right there. And then how is being selfish a way of not showing love to others? Well, when we don't I mean, pretty easy answer there. I mean, if we're selfish, who do we love? Yourself. I don't love nobody else. I don't need nobody. I don't like so-and-so. I, I got me. That's all I need. And that's when we get ourselves in trouble. A lot of times we get ourselves in trouble because we think that's all we need is me. No, we need God first. We need Jesus we need all that, but then you need your family and friends. You need your Christian family and friends there. You need others around you. All right. Next passage here is 3 John 11. I've never known how to... I, that was, that was kind of interesting. I know, I know Steve's taught on this and uh, Mr. Frank and uh, James. and I, I, You never know how to write these because some people are like, 3 John 11. I don't know whether you write 3 John 1 11, because, you know, I've seen different people do that in my studies. Some people had it like 3 John 1 11. Well, no, it's really just, there's only one chapter. It's kind of, I don't know, it's just kind of a little trinket there. It just kind of threw me off. Anyway, 3 John 11, all right? Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So in the books of First and Second John, John is writing the letters to these house churches. So here in the third book of John, he's writing specifically to a friend named Gaius. So remember, those house churches were having problems with the groups of people that were leaving the church and spreading false accusations about the church. And they were deceivers and causing a lot of strife and try, just, trying to, just trying to stir up a lot of stuff. So Gaius had been doing magnificent work for the church. So John has acted here uh, in the third book of John to send this letter to Gaius and encourage him to continue doing all the things that he'd been doing. Saying he was doing a good job, kind of lifting him up, giving him a boost and saying, hey, you can do it. And he wanted to make sure he was keeping that positive attitude. He didn't want him being deceived by others, just like he was writing to those other people in the other two parts of the book. So what can we take from the third letter of John to Gaius? We can use it as a personal letter to ourselves just like it was to Gaius. Because what John is doing, he is telling the reader to be careful of all the influences that are around him. And we know that many inf things uh, influence us, some more than others. So what are some of the things that influence us? Other people. Other people. What else influences us? TV. What else? Music. Family, friends, media, Facebook, Twitter. All that other junk that's on there. Got to be careful of that. I have to be careful of that. Sometimes I get in it's funny. Sometimes you see things that are newsworthy or something like that. But then other things you kind of got to scroll right past. It. We got to be careful of that. 
You know, how does one know when something or someone is good or a bad influence? So remember just a few moments ago when I was talking about the right radio station, you know, trying to find that and tuning it in and out. You know, kind of the same thing here. The more time we spend with Jesus, the clearer the station's going to become in our minds, in our hearts, in our souls. When we were there and when we were with Jesus more and more, then the good and bad influences will show themselves and make them aware, make us aware more of uh, what's going on. It'll focus our attention, you know. You've had, those, you've had those moments. You're like, man, I don't need to be watching this, or I don't need to be hanging around so-and-so, or I don't need to be doing it. You know, your influences. And we've all had those growing pains, and um, we need to help our kids out more than ever. You know, I had those same, but now more than ever, they got more stuff than we had back in the day. You know, they got more junk going on. And we had junk, too, when we was all growing up. But they even got they even got more, and that's the thing about it is we need to t you know it's a learning process, and um, that's one of those struggles too. I, I tell you know I mean I used to tell parents, I tell us grandparents, you hear it too, parents you hear it, those your parents in here, aunts, uncles, well you don't know what I'm talking about. You never went, yeah I did, you know, encourage them, under, make them understand, under, make them understand good and bad influences, help them out, you know. Um, we, all of us in this room, in our lives, we know we've had people try to direct us off our paths of life, and we've also had people influence us over the years. You know, we've had parents, we've had teachers, we've had coaches, we've had ministers, we've had friends, we've had so many different people help us. But at some point, we had to realize ourselves and find out on our own who the good and bad influences were. Because sometimes those people weren't around us all the time to figure it out. And like I said, today, even in social media, they have a new, I think I've shared this before from the pulpit, you know, and you, you know this, uh, they have new jobs out there for people. They're called influencers. They're on social media being an influencer for a company, for maybe a product, or whatever, um, whatever trend is out there. They're influencing people to buy those things, to do those things, and trying to put a positive spin on there. But also, there are bad influencers out there. They're trying to put, they're trying to put a good spin, but they're putting a, a good spin on a bad thing. See what I'm saying? So those influencers are big, and that's more and more that you're seeing in technology, and we need to be wary of that uh, the older and older we get. Because kids are seeing that, and I mean, they're following these people. They're seeing these people on YouTube and all these different things, these influencers. So we have to, we have to be careful of that. But um, hopefully all of us in this room have had more good influencers and bad influencers in our lives. But unfortunately, we are all human. And just like John was warning guys here in this little short book, we need to be wary of the bad influences that are around us because Satan is very strong. We know that. And he can get into our lives very quickly. Uh, we need to understand that we're not all the same. Some of us, what could be a good influence for one could be a bad influence for somebody else. All of us are different. So something that may cause one person to stumble might not cause someone else to stumble. Uh, you know, one example, my love for sports. You know, sports is a big thing. You know, it's okay to love sports. It's okay to follow sports. It's okay to participate, watch it, and so on. But if I let sports take over my life, if I let it start influencing me and my passions, then it's something that turns in from a, it might be a good influence, but it's going to turn into a bad influence because it's taking me away from Jesus. And that happens with a lot of different things. You can, you can figure it out. It could be a TV show. It could be books. It could be uh, social media. It could be whatever, politics, anything like that could take us away and be bad influences. So one way to combat this or other things that take us away from God could be to fast. Now, when you start thinking about fasting, a lot of people turn to not doing what? Eating. They think of not eating, okay? Going on a diet. You think of fasting as only dealing with that. But you might have to fast to take breaks from bad habits and whatever that habit is. It could be turning off Facebook, or, you know, taking a break from Facebook for a while. It could be turning off the TV for a while. 
It could be not reading some of your favorite books because they're taking you away from reading the book that you need to be reading. You see what I'm saying? That fasting can be uh, a thing in that regard. It doesn't have to just be eating. You know, the whole point of a spiritual fasting is to grow closer to God. So some things we might uh, need, some things we might only need to fast from temporarily, but others we might need to fast from permanently in our lives. So let's make sure that our ultimate influencer is, of course, Jesus, okay? All right, so some questions to ponder. What are some bad influences around us? Kind of shared a lot. Anything else that pops to mind? Bad influences are around us? Anything else pop in your mind? What are good influences around us? Each other. Each other. What else? Your spouse. Stanley's trying to get checkpoints for tonight. Church activities. Church activities. Okay. Good influences. I think we have several in here. We have, um, we have meal trains. We have ambassadors. All those different church activities. Ladies are sending cards. How many cards y'all sent this year, Miss Nail, Miss Ruth, Betty Ruth? How many cards y'all sent? 347. And I've gotten two of those, I think. You know, that's a, that's a ministry. Y'all just call, us just calling one another texting one another that's become a simple thing nowadays just texting one another checking up on people our group program life groups i think life groups um have inspired some and get some of us closer together i've seen some things happen in some of the life groups that i don't know if would have happened if it would have been for life groups so just several different things out there uh how can we make sure that to be a good influencer not a bad one how do you stay a good influencer not a bad one Love your neighbor as yourself. What else? One of my pet peeves, I guess, or try to um, be positive, and that's hard. Be positive. Um, be kind. What I'm meaning by being positive, I mean, there, there's so many things. You can be positive. I, I've said this before. Uh, I used to say it all the time to kids uh, when I was in the, the youth ministry. You know, you might have 10, 12, 13, 14, 15, 20 positive things go on in your life. But that one negative thing, if you let it in, it's going to drag you down. And then you just need to outweigh that positive with all, you know, positive is going to outweigh a negative if you let it. Or if you take initiative that. So make sure, try to be the good influencer, be positive, be that, be, a, be kind. Here's another version of 3, 3 John 11. This is from the message, the paraphrase. It says, friend, don't go along with evil. Model the good. The person who does good does God's work. The person who does evil falsify, falsifies God. Doesn't know the first thing about God. That's a pretty, that's pretty direct point there. You know, the ending here in 3 John is very similar also to Matthew 7, verses 17 through 18. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased trees, uh, tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Uh, the ones <clears throat> that are showing good fruit in their lives are the ones that are following God's commandments. The ones that are showing bad fruit in their lives are not following God's commandments. So the healthy tree will not bear bad fruit, nor a diseased tree will bear the good fruit, as we read here. In verse 19, it says, the ones who do not bear the good fruit, if you go on, I don't have that passage up there, but the ones that do not bear good fruit will be cast into the fire. So this raises a question here on this. Judging others, is it okay to judge other people? Yes. Okay. But in Matthew 7, it says you should not judge people. Okay, that's right. But people read it that way, right? 
Okay? That's not exactly what it says. That's right. You got to you got to really look through that because, you know, <clears throat> We got to. Ju- it says there we just got to judge ourselves. We got to look into ourselves and make sure that we're doing the right things. But God does say we can judge someone by their fruits. Okay, if you're thinking that way. Basically, what it's he's it's being said is if we see and know someone that has bad fruits in their lives, we need to be cautious, but we need to also pray for them as well and help them understand and how to get rid of those fruits in their lives. We need to ask God to intervene in their life by also not allowing them to influence us. Uh, on the other hand, we, when we find someone that's bearing good fruit, you know, we need to spend more, and t- more time with fellowship with them. I know I use Brooks a lot of times. Brooks got in trouble a few weeks ago for hanging around some bad friends. He's hanging around bad fruit. And he's got to understand that. That's a tough, and you see kids go through that all the time. Your kids probably went through it too. Kids go through it. Because kids are going to be kids. They're growing. They're learning from their mistakes. But we do it too. We do it as well as adults. We do it too. We hang around people we don't need to be hanging around. We hang around bad influences we don't need to. So if we're around people that are good fruits going on in their lives, then it's possibly going to make sure, it's, it's probably going to have a good influence on us. So the bottom line is good fruit will produce good fruit. Bad fruit is probably going to produce bad fruit. So being around those that are spiritual, healthy, and have a good relationship with God will only help in our spiritual walk and health as well. So here's a couple questions to ponder. How will you know if someone has good fruit? Okay, show it by the way they live. How else? Does their fruit fruit glorify God? That's a good point. Actions speak louder than words. Their reputation. reputation. That's a good one. <laughs> Anything else? Hey, well, you know if someone has bad fruit. The opposite of everything <laughs> Same way, opposite of everything it said. What about if you can't see that bad fruit at first? What's the thing about bad fruit? It always doesn't start out bad. If it ain't wrong, it'll be stinking. That's right. That's a point right there. You, it's, going, it's going to come around. And that's unfortunate sometimes. Um, so how do we check our own fruit? Just got to dig down. I think we got to dig down in ourselves, understand where we're at, under, kind of reevaluate where we're at, and reevaluate how we uh, have Jesus in our life, how, how we reevaluate the influences in our lives, all those different things. So <clears throat> we've spent the last several weeks, uh, like I said, last four weeks in first, second, and third John, and we put a, we probably could have went verse by verse and did all that, and but I think we focused on the main points in these short three books. And we know each one of these, we knew each one of these pretty well, but it's always good to get a refresher course and understand and maybe look from it from a little bit different perspective. But the four things we saw, saw and looked at, God is light, God is love, God has a gift for us of eternal life, and right here at the end, we must love one another, have good influences in our life, so that we can go about and influence others. Okay? So that's the four things we got. A couple passages to close us out, because we always need to remember this. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, and whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And one of the last passages, like I said, <clears throat> this is the command, and one of my favorite passages, John 13, 34, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Okay? It's been good to be with you for four weeks on this. I'm going to take this lesson, and I'm going to share, uh, as I said, next uh, week, um, Eli and I are splitting up the junior and senior high. He's going to take sixth through eighth graders. He wanted me to do ninth through twelfth graders. And I'm going to take these lessons to them and, and share these four weeks with them and also a couple other lessons and then get into some other studies. But anyway, hopefully they'll respond well to these lessons as well. 
Jimmy's going to start next week, Great Stories of the Bible. That's next Wednesday, October 12th. And um, he's going to start there, the Tower of Babel. And um, um, if, if he'll get me a list, we'll get, the, we'll get that in the Pathfinder and show what he's going to uh, do coming up. He'll go for, let's see, three or four weeks. And then Steve Baggett will be here with us on November 9th. So Steve's coming in. He'll be doing our last move lesson, moving to serve him. Uh, so Steve will be here with us. We'll have a meal that night before Bible class like we usually have been ha doing on those Wednesday nights. And then Steve will be there. And then when Steve gets done, Jimmy will go one week. And then after that, it's Thanksgiving week right before Thanksgiving. And then he'll go on for 52 more weeks or something. I don't know. I don't know. We'll, we'll let Jimmy go as long as he can. Okay? Thank you all. Let me say a prayer and we'll be dismissed. Dear Father, thank you for this time together. We pray. For everyone in here and also in our other classes, thank you for the opportunity that we have to worship you. Dear Father, let us go out and be the influencers we need. Let us be the light and learn how to love more like you and share with others around us. And, uh, and be an encouragement just like John was to these uh, churches and his friend Gaius in, this, in these letters. And let us learn from, from these uh, short books to understand how we can uh, uh, grow in our lives to you each and every day. Dear Father, we thank you and pray for all those that are not here tonight for whatever reason, be it those that are on fall break and uh, give them safe journeys home and where, whenever they return. Be with our Bible Bowl kids as they go away this weekend and give them strong minds and hearts and, um, and, and also have good time and fellowship with one another during this uh, time together. Thank you for all their teachers. Thank you for everything. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.